Hey everybody, welcome to the uh, January 29th edition of FISMA Fridays. And uh, we are excited to welcome all of you back for, uh, for another year of this uh, really fun and informative series. And uh, we appreciate uh, the support and all the interest in keeping it going. So we've got some really cool stuff in store this year for the series. We're gonna make some adjustments as we go through the year. Um, and uh, we'll continue to try and keep this fresh and exciting for all of you. But more than anything, Happy New Year. Thank you for being here. and Thanks for supporting this. Uh, we really enjoy bringing this out each and every month. And uh, my name is Brian Sharp. I'm with Safety Chain Software, and I'll be introducing uh, our star of the show here from TAG in just a moment. Um, but to dig in, if you're new to FISMA Fridays, first, welcome, and thanks for checking us out. Uh, we've had a number of you Looks like got some new, a lot of new faces uh, this month, and that's always good to see. Um, this is the longest standing industry update um, in the industry. <laughs> so where uh, this originated over five years ago, going on six years ago now, uh, was really as FISMA was rolling out, and it's very centered around a lot of the FISMA-related news and reg changes and updates. Um, but we also try to expand a little bit. We're going to work to do that a little bit more this year, touch more on some industry trends, best practices, and a lot of what uh, the Atchison Group experts are seeing out there in the field. So look for some, uh, some expansion of topics, if you will, this year. Um, but one of the best parts of FISMA Fridays uh, is really the access to the, uh, the expert consultants over at TAG and an ability to not just hear from them what's going on in the trenches, but you know, have, a, have an open... Q&A with them, which we'll, we'll save for the uh, for the end of the show here. So uh, so welcome. We hope you enjoy it. We, we hold these the last Friday of each and every month. And uh, for those of you that are watching together uh, in conference rooms, uh, hello, I'll wave to you. And uh, for those of you just joining, you know, grab your friends and colleagues, and uh, we hope you'll join us uh, each month on the last Friday. Uh, we put this on uh, free of charge. Hopefully nobody collected money as you came in the door here. Something we're, uh, we're quite proud of and we think is very important and uh, we feel really honored to serve our community with, uh, with this information. So uh, our partner that, uh, that we uh, really appreciate, uh, the Atchison Group, longstanding partner of ours here at Safety Chain, uh, we've worked to put this together and um, really appreciate the support from, from TAG to keep this going. Few uh, housekeeping items as we as we go into this. Uh, one thing, hopefully you'll notice, this is meant to just be more of a conversational, uh, somewhat informal but professional format, right? So don't be shy to fire away questions. Um, typically, what we'll do is save those for the end, but you know this is really meant to be a conversation. So I want to encourage you to use that questions box to fire those away, and uh, we'll certainly get to them um, as much as we can. If for some reason we don't get to all the questions. We do have a really great uh, LinkedIn group for FISMA Fridays, and uh, we'd like to take those offline and make sure all the answers get passed along there as well. So uh, with that, uh, one of the most common questions that we typically get is whether or not we are going to be able to share, uh, share a link. And we'll certainly do that. We're recording now, and we usually pass those out uh, within a day or two of the, of the session. And uh, Eric has been kind enough, who will be joining us today here, share the, a copy of the deck as well. Uh, you also notice only the panelists are displayed. So if you do send us a note, it's just coming to us. Uh, so uh, Eric and myself and uh, Ann, who's behind the scenes uh, here over at Safety Chain. Uh, if you have any audio issues, you know, they do happen sometimes on these webinar services. <laughs> the old simple uh, uh, swap over usually works, right? Go from one audio source, web to phone or phone to web. Uh, typically the web audio actually seems to be the most stable. Uh, and if not, you know, log out, log back in. Uh, we will try and do our best behind the scenes. If you if you have any questions on that, you can use the chat box for, for technical issues. Uh, in terms of what we'll cover agenda-wise, uh, we're gonna start first, just touch on any quick updates. Not a lot going on there, but uh, Eric will cover that. And then uh, we're gonna dig a little bit into uh, hemp and CBD updates. And uh, like we've talked about, get into some of uh, the Q&A as well. So with that, I uh, wanna welcome Eric Edmonds, who's the Food Safety Director over at the Atchison Group, has been uh, a recurring uh, guest, a, re a returning guest, a recurring guest, a popular guest. So Eric, mm -hmm. welcome, good to have you back. Hey Brian, thanks for having me, glad to be here. He has super awesome bio with all kinds of good stuff. He always blushes when I say it, so uh, I encourage you to check out mm -hmm. his 
his background on the website, but all around good guy, but uh, really been a, a leading expert for us in, in the topic we're gonna, we're gonna delve into today. But before we do that, uh, Eric, we were chatting a little bit before we kicked things off about what news, and I guess there's not a lot of news because there's not a lot going on up there. So uh, what, what are you hearing from your side? Yeah, as, uh, as far as specific developments um, around policy and FISMA in particular, there really hasn't been anything uh, in the last month. Just as you know, um, the government is shut down and FDA is operating, they're all government, FDA and USDA in particular, are offering are operating its um, somewhat minimal numbers of employees. Uh, it's the best updates that are coming out right now happen to be coming from Scott Gottlieb on his Twitter account um, as he addresses some of the concerns of industry and uh, Congress and tries to get some information out there. But uh, as far as we know, when the government originally shut down, it was a very minimal staff just doing some four cause inspections and not really doing a whole lot more and in the last week or so, They've put out some announcements that they are trying to operate at about a 50% um, of their workforce is out doing inspections again, but those are largely focused around either for cause or um, very high risk um, food categories. Um, one of the industry groups that really pushed and made it very clear that they needed to be talking to FDA and get more input was the leafy greens market sure. and uh, particularly the leafy greens market in association with the recent issues with romaine and they're really just trying to get on top of the produce safety rule and all these other issues but they need access to the FDA's data and the FDA's assistance to really figure out how to best improve their program. So they've actually pushed the FDA and Congress to get a few more people out and boots on the ground, but there hasn't been a whole lot. Um, there haven't been any warning letters issued since um, that I'm really aware of since the government shut down. And um, it's just been kind of slow from, from that front. Um, just a few updates and uh, via Twitter and so we kind of chose this week to cover a topic that came more or less right before the government shut down that we didn't address in our December uh, right. webinar. So. Right. Okay. Well, I guess I guess that's to be expected, and uh, I guess find that good Twitter follow, right? <laughs> Stay informed mm -hmm. that way. So <laughs> get it where you can get it. Uh, all right. Well, we'll keep we'll keep our eye on that and uh, appreciate appreciate the update. And I think, like we talked about, um, a focus for this month and, and has been a hot topic. And I know you uh, at Tag are actually even launching a, a whole division dedicated to to this market. And um, and there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of change. There's a lot of questions. So um, I, I thought it was great that you had an idea to kind of maybe level up some of these common things that are. That are going on out there. So, uh, so we'll we'll dig a little bit. I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to you, to Eric. Kind of take us through some of the updates around uh, hemp and, and CBD and and what you're seeing out there in the market. Yeah, exactly. So, um, as Brian mentioned, um, the Atchison Group, we have started a new affiliate uh, business that has a lot of crossover between our current employees that we're calling hashtag that really focuses on the cannabis market. Um, so dealing with a lot of specific state regulations and how they're infusing a lot of products with cannabis, um, both food and beverages, um, and working in that area. And this is actually an area that, um, due to some recent changes in the farm bill or the new farm bill for, from 2018, um, a product that is going to be more than just within state cannabis regulations. It's going to be, it's being addressed by the FDA and, it looks like some products will be now be legal for interstate commerce um, and there's still a lot of confusion around what's actually legal and what's not legal so we figured we'd kind of cover this um, because the market has a lot of confusion in it right now um, so just a little bit of background every four years um, congress release, releases something called the farm bill um, or it's an agricultural act, basically. It covers lots of things. Um, it's basically the funding mechanisms for many agricultural programs within the United States. 
Um, so it deals with everything from food stamps to uh, conservation grants for farmland and other type of public lands and things like that. But one of the new issues that's come up in the last two farm bills is the idea of industrial hemp. So industrial hemp is basically a, a relative or cousin of the typical cannabis plant that you think of that um, has been made legal on a recreational or adult use scale in many areas across the country. But what happened in the 2014 Farm Bill, they kind of didn't go all the way, but they allowed individual states to create um, basically agricultural pilot pro programs that were overseen um, by their Department of Agriculture and a state university that allowed them to actually plant industrial hemp with no fear of legal consequence. Um, and kind of do research projects and figure out how it could be used um, in the industry for a, a variety of things, everything from textiles to food um, and, and everything like that. Um, but the 2018 Farm Bill went quite a bit further and it was pushed a lot by some of the representatives and senators out of um, Oregon and also Mitch McConnell out of um, the Midwest. And it's basically, uh, removed what there is the new legal definition for a category of cannabis called industrial hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. So as many of you may know, previously any type of cannabis um, was listed as a Schedule I controlled substances, sub controlled substance. So it was really difficult to conduct any research and definitely illegal to grow it or uh, distribute in commerce or market it. Um, but the Farm Bill created a new definition for a different category um, that removed that category of industrial hemp from the Controlled Substances Act altogether. So the confusion here is a lot of people think, well, that just makes everything involved with hemp legal now. Um, but in reality, uh, by removing it from the Controlled Substances Act, it really just removed industrial hemp from the purview of the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, but there are still a lot of regulatory hurdles and issues in place um, in regard to FDA's authority over its use in food that are still causing some of the confusion and is one of the big issues that we'd, uh, we're planning to address today. So just as another small amount of background, um, industrial hemp, this is the legal definition for it. Um, and the really thing to, to look into that cr creates the difference between your typical cannabis is this last sentence um, with THC concentration of not more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. So THC is the component of cannabis that has psychoactive properties, the one that makes people high or stoned. Um, and so it is possible to grow this plant in a way that the THC content is low enough that you could literally use as much as you want and never have any psychoactive effect or high from the product. Um, and it's deemed to have a lot more uses than both foods and dietary supplements and a lot of other things. Um, but due to some previous actions by FDA this year, it still has some, just some hurdles that I mentioned. And I'll, I'll kind of get into those in the next few slides. But it's that, uh, that small amount of THC, which allows industrial hemp to be removed from the Controlled Substances Act. So there's still some potential that someone may be trying to grow an industrial hemp but due to issues of seed control or something like that, it may end up having a higher percent basis of THC, which would basically, the Farm Bill does allow them kind of a way out of jail in a sense, because if it does end up having over 0.3% THC, they would be growing the illegal drug marijuana, um, whereas um, you can actually have a system in place to have, it have a very low amount of THC and that's the aspect that has been legalized in the 2018 Farm Bill. So the Farm Bill passed on December 20th last year, so very recently, and almost immediately, um, 
right before the government shut down, the FDA released a public statement to clarify their position on the legality of um, using hemp-derived products within um, foods and dietary supplements, supplements and interstate commerce. So they still are very clear. It is illegal and unlawful to introduce any CBD or THC contain, uh, products directly into interstate commerce, uh, regardless of they're hemp derived or not. So the THC is obvious, the CBD is the more confusing part. And the reason this happens is uh, in June or July of 2018, the FDA approved a new pharmaceutical drug called Epidiolex. And it's a drug that has um, kind of a pure CBD isolate that is derived from either hemp or actual marijuana that has gone through and is a long drug review process with FDA and they approved it for the treatment of seizures. Um, and there's a way or the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act actually uh, restricts any ingredient that has been approved as a pharmaceutical active ingredient from being used in a food or dietary supplement. So, and this is what causes a lot of the confusion because you can literally go into any convenience store or online in many places and you find products that are marketed as a CBD product. Um, and they're definitely out there on the market, but there has been very little enforcement on them. Um, even when DEA was still involved before the Farm Bill was passed. And that's just because both the FDA and DEA said, we have bigger fish to fry. Um, they kind of just didn't have the manpower or people power to actually go in a force and take these products off the shelves. And they also recognized that they're so pervasive that if you did actually go confiscate products and CBD products from all these places, not only would it take a tremendous amount of work, time, and resources, uh, all the products would be back on the shelves within two weeks, is what they were assuming. So FDA has historically really limited their enforcement on CBD products and gone after products that are making very specific drug claims, because you will see some out there that on the far end that can say this CBD product cures cancer, or on the other hand, this is uh, increases relaxation and things like that. And there's, so there's kind of a full spectrum of claims that people have made and FDA has historically gone after and given warning, sent warning letters to some of these companies that are making uh, very robust drug claims on their dietary supplements. Um, and if that's just in an effort to make sure that Things that should be sold as drugs and not be allowed over the counter are not being sold um, just to anyone anywhere. Let me see. And so, in that public announcement, the FDA did make some statements that saying we're not totally against these CBD products or hemp derived products, and there are definite legal ways to have it approved or to get it into interstate commerce. The first uh, one being that process that the Epidiolex drug went through, a formal drug approval process with the FDA. And this takes a lot of resources, a lot of time, um, and isn't always guaranteed. You have to have a lot of clinical research to show um, that, um, yes, this drug is effective for its intended use um, and it's safe to use in this manner. So the FDA, kind of recognize that as the number one way for a CBD product to go through, but then they also said, well, we do actually have authority to allow a pharmaceutical ingredient to be used in dietary supplements and foods, um, and so they would have to do a full rulemaking, and they have announced intentions to hold public meetings and hear from the people who are consuming this product, their experiences, the safety of the product, and really consider whether they're going to allow CBD products to be sold in interstate commerce in the future. But as um, we mentioned before, with the drug shutdown, there's been no really progress in this area so far. Um, on the other hand, right before the shutdown, they did note the FDA did uh, include a couple new 
uh, gross determinations, which is the generally recognized as safe for an ingredient for some products of the hemp plant that don't really contain CBD or THC and don't have that uh, same drug impact, even though some people still make some of those claims, which would be illegal um, on some of those products. So when I'm talking about food products that um, don't necessarily have CBD or THC, uh, there's a company that submitted three gross petitions for these three products, Hold Hemp Seed, hemp seed powder and hemp seed oil. And the FDA said uh, that the way they do it is if they have problems, they, they send back questions that the company can answer. And if they don't really see any issues, they issue in a determination of no questions. And um, which more or less says the, the company that submitted these submissions and their scientific evidence, we don't see any problems. So the important thing to note on this, none of these products naturally contains THC. Um, they do mention that trace amounts of THC and CBD can end up on these products through the harvest process, um, but these are the components, the seeds in particular, are components of, uh, of the hemp plant that don't necessarily contain high quantities of CBD and very low um, naturally occurring THCs. It's just kind of that almost like a cross-contamination issue through harvest, uh, through just general agricultural practices, that they may pick up some of it, but it would be in very low concentration. So those three products are definitely considered legal by the FDA now, um, and it's just, um, they're already in, in, in the industry and out in the market, um, lots of granola bars and things like that can, can control them. But the thing that I wanted to touch on shortly um, is this use of CBD because there is a very different um, aspect of just say a hemp oil or a hemp derived product and many of these CBD products that people are claiming. A lot of the CBD products actually contain a CBD isolate as an ingredient which is pure CBD so it's derived from the plant and highly processed or refined or extracted to the point where you don't have any of the other components and you have a pure CBD and you can add it into your food or dietary supplement in the concentration that you want. Um, so you see some of those products that say 10 milligrams of CBD per serving or something like that. Those are the ones that are using the CBD, CBD isolates that they can more appropriately dose in the, um, in the food or dietary supplement. And there is a historical legal example of where this may go if FDA doesn't go through that rule approval process and actually um, recognize CBD isolate as a potential uh, safe ingredient that can be used in interstate commerce. And as far as for the CBD market, um, they're gonna want FDA to likely make a specific rule that says we are allowing this in food or a new policy statement or something like that because the historical example doesn't um, bode well for CBD isolate products. And it's actually something um, that happened, well, over 10 years in the 80s and 90s with something called red rice yeast and lovastatin. Red rice yeast is a, a product that's been used for since ancient times, basically. Um, I think like 1800 AD is the first historical use in some of the Chinese dynasties that it was used for its um, therapeutic processes or its therapeutic benefits. Um, and a lot of dietary supplements started using that, uh, this lovastatin, which is the active ingredient in the red rice yeast that actually reduces cholesterol levels. They started using in dietary supplements in the 1990s and actually made cholesterol reduction claims and things like that. But what came to a head was that uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies that had um, a drug approved by the FDA in 1987 that used lovastatin as its active ingredient. And in 1999, I think it was, uh, the FDA decided to, um, in 1997, I have it on the slide right there. Um, but FDA decided to enforce a, and regulate all these dietary supplements that were including lovastatin in their dietary supplements for its medical benefits. Um, 
the companies, uh, the company that was producing the most of this dietary supplement actually won the first round in court um, and the FDA appealed it to a district court and the district court um, sent it back down for a reconsideration to the original court. And after that kind of four or five year process of legal battles, um, the original court decided, well, you're not actually using a red rice, the red rice yeast that has historically been used since the 18, since, uh, since ancient times, basically. You're processing it to increase the level and you're isolating it. And so it's really just, you're focused on this active drug ingredient. And they decided that, no, you cannot use this in a dietary supplement because it is an active drug ingredient. And so it's no longer available over any product. Is, no products are available over the counter anymore that contain lovastat. And, and to this day, FDA still does random samplings of some of these dietary supplements that um, could contain the lo increased levels of lovastat to make sure that the companies aren't processing to the level to increase the uh, amount of low statin in their dietary supplements above the naturally occurring le levels and the red yeast, rice yeast. And that's really relative to the hemp and CBD as hemp has a lot of different products um, in it and CBD is just one of the ingredients. And like I said, a lot of these dietary supplements right now are using CBD as the active ingredient. They're isolating it and amplifying it to where the products that people are eating are not naturally occurring levels of CBD in the end product. They're increased levels. And since there is this conflict with the approval of epidiolics, um, there is an issue in that, that the legal precedent shows that the CBD companies would likely lose and they'd have to move down into a more naturally occurring level. So this is kind of a summary of that whole concept. Um, and where we see the future of CBD and hemp products going. So right now, FDA has already recognized naturally derived hemp, hemp products without any amplification of a single component, especially CBD, which is considered an active drug ingredient, can and likely will be considered uh, gross or recognized safe by the FDA. Um, but they have also announced that they're very interested in the public interest in the topic and Congress had an intent to make these products because they were largely thinking about CBD um, due to its, and the Farm Bill specifically allows um, that um, just because they recognize Congress. So they're, they're willing to work with the industry, hold public hearings and consider it. Um, and that is the most sure way to get a public rule that actually states CBD can be used in food and dietary supplements. So, for companies looking to use CBD or hemp products in their, in their food or dietary supplements now, the, the major issues to consider are the sources of hemp products. So you actually hear stories of people taking a CBD product and then failing a drug test. And a lot of that may happen because of the sourcing. They haven't appropriately sourced and made sure that they're getting hemp products and can contain less than 0.3% THC. But at the same time, less than 0.3% percent THC still contains THC. So there is always potential to fail a drug test by using one of these CBD products. So the difference being um, in ingredients, these broad and full spectrum hemp oil, something that's just a oil pressed out of a hemp plant um, or the seeds like the, the earlier grass determinants that have already been made, um, are there. Um, the, the real scary one for industry that there's a lot of gray area is the CBD oils and the CBD extracts and isolates um, that would be considered an active drug ingredient. And although not a lot of enforcement has taken place within those now, um, you have to be really wary about the claims you're making on the products, whether they're any drug or structure function claims, and then also whether it could be potentially misleading. So you notice some companies have, have converted to kind of a broad hemp oil or hemp seed oil area, and then um, they kind of list CBD as an ingredient, which could be misleading to the consumer because it's not a true CBD oil. It's actually a full or broad spectrum hemp oil that has only small or naturally occurring levels of CBD, um, which 
could be misleading to the con customary consumer who actually sees CBD in bold print on the label. So there's those two big issues on the product besides the overall legality of CBD oil and hemp oils and things. It's what claims are you making and are they misleading um, or are they related to medical issues? So unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot more information right that, but we, we are here to help companies with um, assistance and kind of navigating these areas um, and uh, looking into marketing this on an interstate level and to see where FDA will go in the future. But that's something that we'll be um, anticipating as soon as the government reopens because we expect them to make some progress on this in a relatively short time. Good stuff. Thanks, Eric. I, I'm glad I got out of the way. I knew there was a lot of questions and uh, appreciate you uh, giving us a good high level overview. I, I want to point out really quick, one of the things that Eric and his team have put together, a really cool website. It's at hashtag.global. So that's hashtag.global. It's a site they built dedicated to this. They got a great blog, some good info there. Um, I know we've got a few questions. I'll try and grab one or two. I don't want to keep this over too much because I want to respect everyone's time here at the bottom of the hour. Um, so uh, I, one question came in is just about um, what would happen in the situation where FDA had said that according to their calculations, there's not enough hemp grown to produce the available amount of CBD and therefore all CBD is suspect. Have you are been aware of them referring to that? I'm not personally aware of that statement, um, particularly because there are actually ways to import CBD products and hemp products from um, foreign countries. So mm -hmm. in the U.S., I, I think that could be very likely. But in general, that's why we say the supply chain, your supply chain when you're using this product has to be really, um, supply chain controls have to be really in tune and right. on top of it because that is the uh, it, it's the reality that a lot of the product is suspect um, yeah. at this time, even if it's grown under a state regulatory program with uh, oversight from the state. Right, and that's uh, that's where it's so challenging, right? It's there, there's so many different ways to go, and there's still questions and ambiguity there. So, uh, so I appreciate you guys being available for that. We're going to we're gonna take anything else uh, offline just to respect everyone's time, um, but we will share the recording and a copy of the deck. Uh, also access to uh, their contact info when we send that follow up. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn and we'll take any of the other questions offline there and encourage you to uh, keep the conversation uh, going on that side. If you have specific questions, again, I want to encourage you to reach out to them directly. Uh, I think this is a great example of where their expertise can really come in handy and, uh, and help work through some, some really confusing transitions, but important ones, right? Uh, so you can check them out at atchisongroup.com. I also mentioned their other uh, site dedicated to this topic, um, which is hashtag.global. And on the technology side, he was, Eric was just referring to, you know, managing that supplier network. And so if you're looking for a way to make it a little bit faster, easier, more productive, uh, for you and your teams to, to manage all of these changes and transitions uh, in and around quality and safety and obviously your supplier network. Um, that's something we do here at Safety Chain with our cloud-based food quality management system. So I encourage you to check out what we're up to over at safetychain.com. Got a lot of exciting stuff and uh, a demo day coming up next week, which uh, we'd love to have all of you join and, uh, and check us out. Uh, with that, a um, couple of things in terms of uh, follow-up, uh, we'll send out the recording and uh, we have our ongoing uh, Beyond Compliance webinar series, so I encourage you to go to our resources page on our website at Safety Chain. You can get access to all of the FISMA Fridays, so we have a whole library there uh, in addition to some of the, um, uh, the recent webinars we've done for Beyond Compliance. Um, also, the TAG newsletter is a great way to stay informed. Uh, one of our, our fan favorites here. And then next month, we'll, uh, we'll do this again on, um, let's see, I think that would actually be February 22nd is what that would be. So uh, so I want to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, Eric, thank you. That was a good timely topic. A lot of questions we're seeing too. So thanks for putting that together for us and uh, appreciate you having you on. And want to thank everybody for making some time in your busy schedules to be part of FISMA Fridays. Have a great Friday, wonderful weekend, and uh, we'll see you next month.
Okay, you too, Brian. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Eric. Take care.